we're thinking about why we think the way we think, or how do we know what we know, and some of the things that we've been looking at lately is just what shapes our mind or the way we think. Um, in a previous message, we looked at some dimensions of that, and now we're going to continue thinking about what shapes your mind. And back of this um, lies the basic question, is your mind a machine? We live kind of in the age of the machines. And ever since we got into the age of the machines, people tend to picture the mind as a machine as well. And with the invention of computers, um, computers are kind of a model for how minds work. A few centuries ago, um, the great mathematician Descartes thought that all knowledge ought to work the way math works. And in a computer age, we may tend to think that um, knowledge is like a well-running computer. The machine does its job, and if you give it the right data, spits out the right answers. And so we ought to aim to have minds that are like excellent machines that process data accurately and spit out correct answers. Well, the short answer to is your mind a machine, the shorter answer is no. Um, it may have some things in common with a machine, a um, certain ability to calculate, to store things, retrieve them later, and so on. But there is a lot that shapes our thinking besides uh, mere mechanics and data input. Last time we looked at the fact that your social setting shapes your mind. Who do you fit with has a tremendous influence on what you think and your knowledge and what you believe. And today we're going to pay closer attention to how your actions and your heart shape the way your mind thinks. Um, your actions, what's your pattern of behavior? How you behave has a huge impact on what you find believable or unbelievable, what you consider knowledge or hooey. And then closely related to that is your heart. What are the things that drive you, that motivate you, that move you? And once again, those will have a very strong impact on what you file away as sensible in your mind. I'm just a quick review of what we looked at about your social setting. From the book of Proverbs, we saw a number of, of texts. Here are a couple of the most prominent. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. One who's righteous is a guide to his neighbor. The way of the wicked leads them astray. Who you hang out with guides you to a significant degree. It doesn't shape everything, but it has a big impact on what you believe and on what seems to you to be knowledge. And your social setting includes your family. What impact did your parents have on you? Um, how do your siblings, um, your brothers and sisters affect what you think is right and what you think is false? Um, how does your spouse, the person you marry, shape the way you believe and behave. Um, then, of course, there's other opportunities. Proverbs talks about the dangers of joining with a gang, of falling in with a crowd who's up to no good. They'll shape the way you behave, but also the way you believe. Um, you hang out with people, and we live in an age where communication it connects you with people even when you're not with them. And sometimes when you are with them, you're look, too busy looking at your cell phone to look them in the face. But at any rate, there are a variety of ways that we still connect with each other, and those connections, the way the people around us think, shapes the way uh, we think. Our friends have a big impact on us. And all of that is something that the sociologists call a plausibility structure. A system of meaning makes sense and becomes plausible within a particular social setting. And so you've got the relational ties that we've been talking about, as well as institutions and some traditions that have built up. And these socialize newer members of a community so that some things just seem self-evident. You don't even need to think about them. You just know them, or at least think you know them. And other things just seem silly. Uh, you don't even need to think about them because they can't be true. Well, even if they are true. Uh, but you're socialized into just ruling certain things totally out of bounds and other things absolutely beyond question. And a plausibility structure is that whole network of relationships and institutions and traditions that does that. And in our society, it's not just family or friends and a, and a gang of people you might hang out with, but also 
um, an institutional structure such as school, the people at school, as well as the teachings and the way a whole curriculum is structured, what it leaves out, what it insists on teaching, what things count as knowledge, other things just don't count in the realm of fact, and so they get left out. Government and its decisions can have a big impact. Something that's very controversial. Once the government decides it, you go 30, 40, 50 years, and all of a sudden everybody just takes for granted. Social security is not a topic of discussion, except for the fact that it might go bankrupt. But other than that, it's not nearly as controversial as it was in the 30s when people introduced the idea in the first place. Um, universal health care is very controversial here in the United States. It won't be if it's embraced. It won't be very controversial in 50 years because it will be institutionalized by our government and people grow up being used to a certain thing. Um, government, of course, is probably not as important yet in shaping minds as media, um, film, music, uh, TV, and the like. So you've got all of this which forms a plausibility structure of what's either certain or um, silly and these things shape the way we think. And you always have to, when you're asking about your knowledge, you say, now what world formed my worldview? Maybe it's a combination of worlds, but how did I get to think that way? It wasn't just data feeding into my great computer. Uh, it's the context of people and institutions that had a big impact. And we need to understand that Christian community is the plausibility structure for the gospel. It's the social setting where biblical belief makes sense. Some people like to think of just Christianity as some sort of absolute truth dangling somewhere in the sky that gets fed into our computer. And certainly it is a gospel message that's proclaimed, and it is true, but there's still a setting where it just sounds right, and other settings where it sounds, come on, I am not sure about that, and other settings where it sounds like, oh, no way in the world! And if you spend too much time in one setting and not enough in another, you find it very, very, very hard to believe. And so you have Christian community of the family as a social setting where you're taught the Word of God, but not just the times of teaching. What makes it plausible or not plausible is the way that whole family functions. If it is a mess, if it is a place of bickering and anger, then it is not a plausible place to believe the gospel, even if the Bible is read there from time to time. Now, it may not be perfect, but many families make Christianity more plausible. Others make it less plausible. Your social setting will do that. Sometimes it's just the hanging out with other Christians and talking to each other. Um, and, and you may not even be talking about the things of God, but, just a, but a, just a healthy and happy way of interacting makes this seem to make sense. And of course, there are times when you're just all together as a church, when you're praising God together, um, when the gospel is being proclaimed. And all of these are ways when people get together and it makes a setting where the gospel gets a better hearing. Sometimes there is certain kinds of media that's produced trying to convey an explicitly Christian message. A film such as Courageous might do that. There are other films which help a plausibility structure if they uphold ideas of good and evil and of heroism and of right and wrong, um, even though they're just telling a good adventure story. Uh, they, they make some things more believable. There are other kinds of films which just portray everything as total chaos without any rhyme or reason, and they might um, detract from that. Now, C.S. Lewis thought that one of the most important things Christians could do was write non-Christian books, in a sense. Write them as Christians without their Christianity being explicit. Because he knew that a direct communication of the gospel in a society that doesn't like to hear the gospel, or that it tends to just dismiss it as old-fashioned or out of it, needs sometimes to be approached indirectly or just have its whole plausibility structure changed. And so one of his efforts was to write some science fiction books. Science fiction was kind of a popular um, style of writing at the time, um, still is. And so he wrote uh, three science fiction books and, and embedded in that some of his ideas and his beliefs. He later wrote a series of fairy tales, The Chronicles of Narnia, which he was said he was trying to steal past the watchful dragons that are always guarding against what's explicitly um, Christian, 
and just give the gospel story a hearing in kind of a different form. Also, he was just a great scholar, and so he would write books just on scholarly stuff. He wrote an introduction to medieval and Renaissance literature, and he doesn't explicitly push for Christianity being the true and best way. He does say some very profound things about worldview and the way you think. And he thought there ought to be some journals that were established that weren't necessarily explicitly Christian journals, but just dealt with some ethical matters and where you had some Christian contributors. Now, the whole idea, I'm not here emphasizing Lewis so much as the idea of when you get into film, when you get into writing, when you get into business, when you get into different realms of life, you just go there as a Christian and you become part of what makes Christianity either more believable or less believable because you're contributing to that social setting. So you want to be aware not just of what you absorb from your social setting, but what you contribute to it and how you both directly in telling the gospel of Jesus to others, but also kind of indirectly in just thinking Christianly and acting Christianly and communicating in the manner of a Christian certain things will become more believable to people who have hung around you. So that's the first thing that I'm highlighting about what shapes your mind. A second then is your actions. What's your pattern of behavior? Now at first that might seem a little strange because you might see the traffic running only in one direction where your mind shapes your actions. You think something, you want to do it, and so you do it. But the mind comes first and then the behavior follows. Well, sometimes, sort of, but very often behavior makes certain things more believable or less believable. And again, in the book of Proverbs, a couple of passages. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. Evil men do not understand justice. But those who seek the Lord understand it completely. You see what's going on? There are certain people who can't grasp or understand something, and it's because they are behaving the wrong way, and they can't afford to believe a different way. And their behavior blinds them to what they otherwise might believe. And as you read the, just the whole book of Proverbs, one thing comes through very powerfully. Wisdom is basically knowing through doing. Wisdom is very practical in the book of Proverbs. The knowledge and the action are very, very tightly connected. And doing is based on knowing. There's a two-way traffic between knowing and doing, not just a one-way traffic. And so if you in your own life are saying, boy, I find certain Christian claims really, really, really hard to believe, there may be purely intellectual roadblocks for you, but you should really ask also, are there any behavioral roadblocks? Are there things I'm doing that are making my path like deep darkness, that I can't see what makes me stumble, that the light doesn't make sense to me because the path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter. I'll just give an example from history. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is one of the most influential philosophers who's ever lived. He was a Frenchman. And Rousseau believed that people are born good but are corrupted by family and by social institutions. That's one of his beliefs, and it's a belief that has spread very very widely in our society. Children are innocent. They're born good and they just need to flower into that perfection that society and family keeps them from achieving. But what do you do? Um, what is there instead of just the connections of society and family? Well, thank goodness there's government and children who would be ruined by their stupid parents might turn out if there is a wise government in charge of their upbringing and their education. And the real will of people, at least of their best selves, is expressed in the actions and decisions 
of government. And so the bigger the government and the smaller the other social institutions, the better. The ideal is to have just a bunch of individuals and their splendid government. The institution of church and the institution of family and all those other corrupting institutions have to be minimized. And um, finally, among other beliefs, um, sex without marriage is healthy and right. Now, you say, well, what do you mean that's Rousseau's thinking? Isn't that almost everybody's? Well, yeah, it is an awful lot of people's thinking, um, and Rousseau was one of the people who made it most explicit in his philosophy. Now, those are his beliefs. Let's look at Rousseau's behaviors for a moment. Um, he sponged off others his whole life. He was a sluggard and a lazy bones. He was very happy to have society, or at least his friends, um, responsible for him because he was just too important to actually get any dirt under his fingernails. He did end up getting wealthy by inheriting what his father had and then making sure that his brother was declared legally dead so that he could inherit the rest. He had no other interest in his brother. Um, the one historian says he saw his family as just a cash machine. But at any rate, for a while he was on his own and he didn't have his inheritance yet. And there was an old lady who helped him out four different times and kept him from having his life totally ruined. Then after he became wealthy and had his inheritance, she became ill and ran out of money, and he let her die without helping her at all. Um, he had a mistress, and he said in his own writings, this isn't it just guesswork on my part, he said in his own writings he had no love for her at all, but she gave him pleasure and satisfied his desires. Well, five children came out of that. He had other mistresses as well, but he had five children. He abandoned them all to a state orphanage, which had a 5% survival rate to adulthood. Now let us stand back and connect these dots. Do you think that a man who behaves this way might find it convenient to believe that government is responsible for children and not fathers? Do you think that a man whose ideal is sexual freedom might find that ideal a little more appealing if he's somebody who has been behaving in this manner? Do you think that maybe somebody who wants government to look out for everybody, was himself a lazy, no-good sponge. There is the possibility that Rousseau's behavior had some impact. It was not just his brilliant intellect, and he did have a very brilliant intellect, but that's not the only thing that shaped his thinking. And it's still not the only thing that shapes the thinking of those who like his thinking. His thinking appeals to those who act like he did. Those are the ones who are most receptive to the kind of teaching that Rousseau's philosophy still has. So behavior shapes belief. Of just a few more examples, I've mentioned Rousseau. If you've got a workaholic tycoon who's made a ton of money, he has the belief that the free enterprise system blesses everybody. Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but you can sure see why he thinks it's a blessing because he just got rich. A slave driver believes that blacks are less human than he is and that scripture favors slavery. Now can you see why he might think that? It's not just scholarly exegesis of scripture or objective analysis of the personalities of black persons. He's a slave owner. It suits him well to believe this. Live-in couples um, widely believe that living together first makes a good marriage more likely. Now, this is the stupidest belief which you do not need any theology or morality to correct. All you need to know is an itty-bitty smidgen of sociology, and you will know that every study on the subject finds that people who live together before marriage are more likely to get divorced. But don't let facts get in the way of belief, because the fact is, they're doing it. And therefore, it's got to be a better way, right? So the belief is often dictated by the behavior. If you get a man who's kind of a control freak, 
you'll find that he really likes teachings and books on male patriarchy and very strict male management of all things related to family and other things. Now, there are things in the Bible that do teach things about male leadership, I believe, but there are some with whom those texts find a fabulous reception and other texts about um, sacrificing for one's wife um, are falling on a little deafer ears. So once again, the kind of person you are and the kind of behavior you're engaged in make some things sound just as true as can be. A child who's a rebel, who is just mad, is going to have a very strong belief that parents are stupid, they don't understand, and they're very unfair. Now, there may be some truth in that, but if you've been doing a lot of stuff in direct rebellion against your parents, it's quite convenient for you to believe that they're dunderheads as well, isn't it? A party animal thinks that the Bible is outdated. Uh, you start behaving a certain way, and all of a sudden the Bible just is an old, dusty book. Someone has said, either the Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. I know of a pastor who um, was talking with a young woman who said she was um, losing her faith and no longer believing that stuff that she had been taught growing up. And he asked her, well, when did, you know, when did this kind of start to happen? You know, could you kind of put your finger on, a, on the time frame when Christianity started making less sense to you? And she said, well, it, it was kind of around last Thanksgiving during my first year at college. And he says, well, is there anything that you can recall, any other event that happened around then, um, that particular time? And she was quiet for a minute. And then she started to weep, and she said, well, that's when I started sleeping with my boyfriend. And so it was not that she was taught something brand new at that particular college or that any new intellectual data came her way. It was she started behaving in a different manner, which directly contradicted what she knew Christianity taught, and all of a sudden Christianity seemed not to be so true after all. Now, Jesus described this uh, very powerfully. He described it in the same passage where he talks about the need to be born again. And he shows why it's so important to be born again. He said, the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. You see that? He's doing bad stuff. His works stink. And so he wants to stay where the works can't be seen for what they are. He avoids light. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be seen clearly that his works have been carried out in God. Somebody who is doing the works God calls for and as a born-again person has a life that flows out of being born again wants to come into the light so that he can say, yeah, this is what God is doing in me. And so some people are avoiding light. Others are seeking light. And before moving on, I just want to point out that one phrase, whoever does what is true. That's an interesting way of phrasing it. Some translations put it a little differently, but this is closer to the literal way it said. He does what is true. Usually we say, well, he does what's right or whatever. But he's doing truth. And there's that powerful connection between what you do and what you know. You are doing truth, and truth is making sense in your head as well. Just think of driving a vehicle along, and your wipers are not very good wipers, and you're going through an area with a really muddy road, and others are coming past you, and you're getting mud just splattered all over your windshield. And... Man, that thing is, is just covered with mud, and you run the wipers a little, and so you can see a few things a little bit through the streaks of mud, but not very well. That's what wrong deeds do to your mind. Filthy living splatters mud all over your mind, and all of a sudden, you just can't see certain things very well anymore. It's not just that you 
decide and have things in your head, and then all of your behavior flows from that. Your behavior splatters things back on your mental windshield. And it either, um, your behavior will either make it easier for you to see or way, way harder for you to see. 2 Timothy 3, it talks about some wicked men, some wicked women. It says, weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. They're always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. See, all in one breath. They're burdened with sins, and they're always hearing stuff, but they can never just take it in and know it. And there's these men who oppose the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. So they're doing wrong things, these men are, and their minds are corrupted by what they do. So in short... The connection between actions and knowledge is that in order to see clearly, you've got to have a clear lens. And a person whose life is wicked will end up with a wicked philosophy of life. A nation which is wallowing in wickedness will come up with laws and ways of thinking that suit the way that it wants to behave. This is... Um, this is what goes on in this connection between knowledge and behavior. So, we need to understand that truth is not just something that you feed data into the mental computer. Truth is something that you act upon, and the more you act upon it, the truer it seems to you. James talks about this. He says, if anyone's just a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. He looks, but then... He goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. When you hear God's word and don't act upon it, it goes, it's kind of like the, the hard path in Jesus' parable of the soils. The, the birds just swoop in and snatch that seed away and it's gone. The devil comes and snatches it away. If you put it into practice, then it sticks with you. It lodges in your memory. That's just the way it is in a lot of things, isn't it? If you learned a language, some of you maybe, st I studied German 30 years ago, and I can still say Guten Tag, wie geht's, and that, you know, that kind of stuff, but I haven't used German for 30 years and I can't remember hardly a thing of it. I studied Greek 30 years ago, and I study Greek often in, pre in preparation of sermons as well as in my own reading, and I read the Greek New Testament. I still know Greek because I'm doing that stuff. When you're not practicing and carrying out and acting on something, it tends to fade from your mind as well. Daniel is talking about later times, and he says, None of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. Again, if you're wicked, it impedes your understanding. If, if you're doing what's right um, and you're wise in the Lord, then you understand. So here's, here's just one important guideline. Sometimes if you're struggling with your belief, with whether Christian truths make sense to you, you might say to yourself, boy, I wish God would show me more, would make himself more obvious to me. And if he would, I would start behaving well. What if the order might be a little different? What if you need to start acting as though Christianity is true, and after acting as though it's true for a little while, some of the mud might be off your windshield, and you might see more, and the truths of the Bible might start to seem more obvious to you. Jesus says it this way, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. He says, if you want to do God's will, you'll find out. If you don't want to do God's will, you're going to be clueless whether my teaching is from God or not. So what influences your mind? Your actions do, big time. And then very closely connected with that is your heart. What moves your inner self? Because the connection between heart, your desire, what moves you, and what you do, and what you think, these are all very tightly connected. Again, to look at Proverbs, an intelligent heart acquires knowledge. The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge. 
Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. My son, give me your heart. And who can say I've made my heart pure? I'm clean from my sin. You see, and these are just a few of the texts. If you read the whole Bible, heart is mentioned hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And throughout the book of Proverbs, heart is immensely important. And if your heart is off, your head will be too. That's the short answer. If your heart is right, your head will be increasingly right in the things that it understands and in the things that it believes. And so it is absolutely essential to watch over your heart like, like you're guarding a precious treasure. Guard your heart because everything else flows out from it. Guard it well. And if you don't guard your heart and pay close attention to your desires and your inclinations, then you're not going to understand why your mind works the way it does. Now, you can have a taste for food, and the food may be the same, but your taste for it can change depending on your own condition. I knew when we were going to have another baby because I would see Captain Crunch in the house. And whenever I saw Captain Crunch, I thought, She's got to be pregnant. She hates Captain Crunch. Except when there's a baby on the way, and then all of a sudden, Captain Crunch is her supreme delight. And she loves fried chicken and chicken of every form, except during those times when there's a baby on the way. And then all of a sudden, chicken makes you want to, ugh, it's horrible. Now, the chicken is the same. The Cap'n Crunch is the same. The condition is different. When it comes to matters of truth, the truth is always the same. The truth that God reveals is the same. But whether you go, eh, yuck, or whether you say, oh, man, his word is sweeter to me than honey, depends a lot on your condition. There are people who hate the Bible, and there are others who just love it and delight in it. And it, the Bible's the Bible. But it's this whole Captain Crunch syndrome. You know, what, you know, what is your condition? That may shape whether you like that particular thing or not. And so you always have to check out, what is my heart condition? Is that affecting why I believe what I believe? Now, it's not only Christians who have understood that the orientation of your heart can affect the way you think and that we're not just thinking machines. They borrowed quite a bit from Christianity, actually, but at any rate, they themselves were atheists. Karl Marx claimed that most of what we think about stuff is shaped by economic factors. Economics determine our thoughts and our ideals. Now, I don't think he was right that it determines everything, but he sure had a point. When people's economic interests are at stake, you can predict a lot about their political beliefs, a lot about other things they believe. Um, Sigmund Freud claimed that unconscious urges dominate our minds, that things we're hardly even aware of are working below the surface to control what we think. And of course, when it came to religion, he thought that religion was just wishful thinking, but he also thought a great deal of other things that we think or believe are shaped by wishful thinking or by our urges. And Friedrich Nietzsche said that nearly everything that we think is shaped by a will to power. We want control over others around us or other things around us, and that's the motivation behind claims to truth and morality. There really is no objective truth. There is no real right and wrong. There's only a will to power that puts on this mask of being true or this mask of being moral or right. Now again, I believe there is truth, and there is morality, and I believe that Nietzsche was right to a degree that a great deal of what people say about what is true or about what is moral is shaped at least in part by them wanting to manipulate other people. Sometimes parents who are very insistent that their children never, 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 ever lie to them may have their child's honesty and future maturity at heart, or they may just want to be able to make sure they know everything so that they control the kid. 
They themselves might not be paragons of honesty. The reason they want the kid to be honest is because it benefits them as the one in charge. So um, these atheists, they were wrong to reject God, but they were right in this. They were right to see that many claims to rightness are just a mask for hidden drives. Now, of course, you can quick do a little turnabout. You can say, well, Marx, if everything is just motivated by economics, then your whole theory is not necessarily truth. It's just kind of an economic byproduct. Um, you can say to Freud, yeah, if everything's wishful thinking, I guess that tells us something about your theory, doesn't it? It's just wishful thinking. It's got to be. You said so. Um, Nietzsche, well, I don't believe your philosophy is true because you say no philosophy is true. You say it's all just a will to power, so at least that tells us what yours is. You're trying to manipulate people. I'll take you for your word. I don't believe that everybody's always trying to manipulate, but I believe you are. You know, I'll take you at your word. So you, you can turn these kinds of things around on folks quickly enough, but don't miss their point before you do, that there are economic motives. There is a lot of wishful thinking from the heart that goes into our belief. And there is a lot of desire to manipulate others that goes into the things we claim as morality. Pascal was one of the great Christian philosophers of all time. And Pascal is famous for saying, the heart has its reasons of which reason knows nothing. Now, Pascal lived at the same time as Descartes. Descartes was trying to construct all knowledge on this system uh, like mathematics, where you have these axioms that nobody can doubt, and then everything else can be calculated from them. And Pascal lived at the same time and says, no, 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 Rene, you, you don't get it. Um, the heart has its reasons, of which reason knows nothing, and it's always going to be that way. And Descartes couldn't just come back at Pascal and say, yeah, but that's just because you're bad at math. Well, not quite. Pascal was one of the great mathematicians of all time and invented the computing machine, okay? So, when I say the mind is not a machine, I'm echoing Pascal, but Pascal knew his machines. Uh, he was the, the superior mathematician and the inventor of the computing machine, and he said, we're not that. We're more than that. The heart has its motives. And so when you look at your own heart, you have to ask, now, what desires move me? Not just what data makes sense to me, but what drives me? What do I desire? What do I crave? What do I want? And sometimes we're not even fully aware of that and we can't put it into words, but we'll never understand ourselves until we grasp a little bit more of that. What worries you? You know, what goes through your head again and again and you say, oh, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope that doesn't happen. What are you scared of? These kinds of things will shape what you believe and think you know. Just what are your inclinations? What way do you tilt? Everybody tilts in one direction or another, and you may not even be aware of the tilt of your heart in, on various matters. But the heart is not just a neutral thing. It leans. What makes you feel happy? What kind of things make you smile or laugh? What makes you feel good? You are not a thinking machine. And so the things that make you feel good are going to contribute to what seems true to you. Here's a big one, one that Freud and the other psychologists are off and on to. What hidden hurts haunt you? What is stuff that happened to you, that scarred you, that wounded you, sometimes very long ago, maybe sometimes more recently, but something that you just can't quite get over? Again, for many people, They've almost forgotten these things, or their mind has repressed them. And yet, they continue to shape their personality and to shape the very way that they think and believe. And of course, the heart is a decider. The will is, is the heart. It is what makes decisions. What do you choose? What have you made up your will to go after? The will is at the very core of who you are. And very, very often, the will will lead the mind, not just follow it. The mind doesn't just sit back and analyze all things, and then the will makes a choice based on the data. There, of course, sometimes there's input of data and knowledge from the mind of the will, but sometimes the will wants what it wants when it wants it, and it will find ways to provide a rational explanation for what it has already decided. 
Jesus and the whole scripture talk about a light within you or a lack of light. Again from Proverbs. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all his innermost parts. Part of that spirit of man is his conscience, which sheds God's light on the various options that we're considering. But your conscience can get darkened after a while. And your intellect can either get darkened or enlightened. God's lamp can get dimmer and dimmer within you. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked, are sin. So you have the lamp of the Lord and the lamp of the wicked. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he said, If the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. A heart of darkness where the candle of the Lord no longer shines. And in our Bible reading passage for today, Jesus says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, and a lot of other evil actions as well. But notice the first thing, out of the heart come evil thoughts. What shapes your mind? What shapes your thoughts? Your heart does. And so we need to pray to God that we will have that candle lit within us by God. And we need to be reborn by the Spirit of God and have that light of Christ in us again. Loving and knowing are tightly connected. Again, if you don't love with your heart, your mind gets blocked. If I'm stuck on myself, I just can't understand things or persons outside me. I can't look at them as they are. I can only see them as they are towards me. And that's a huge problem for a lot of people in family life. Sometimes a husband is clueless about his wife, and, and he might say to himself, oh, yeah, but, you know, that's just because I'm, I'm a man, and, you know, we men don't get these things, and we're kind of dumb on certain matters, or at least we're different, and so how are we supposed to know? Well, there's a certain element of truth in that. If you're wired quite differently than another person, it is a little harder to understand them. But if you love them a great deal, you are eager to find out what makes them tick and what ticks them off. You're <laughs> eager to just find out who they are, not just who they are in relation to you. If you don't really love somebody, you're quite content with them as long as they're doing what you want them to do. As long as they're providing what you were hoping for, you think you're getting along pretty well and you think you're loving them quite a lot. When you really love somebody is when you're eager simply to know who they are in themselves, not just how they've been pleasing you lately. And so love can open your eyes, where otherwise, with a lack of love, you're just not interested in finding out in the first place. And it's very hard for you to notice what's going on in your spouse. It's very hard for you to notice what's going on with your children. Part of our failure in loving one of the dangers if you have a very compliant and well-behaved kid is you might never get to know that child because you don't need to. They're doing their job as far as you're concerned. They're staying out of trouble. They're making your life uh, sail along quite smoothly. It's when you find out they're different than you are and when they are not fitting comfortably into what's easy for you that you really have to get to know them in a hurry. And then you have to keep praying now, is my motive my love for them? or simply because their current behavior is pretty inconvenient for me. Often, given the nature of our own sinfulness, it's a lot of both. But love is key to understanding somebody else. If I see it only in light of how they fit my agenda, I just can't see somebody else the way they really are. I can't listen to them. I'm eager to get, I'm, before they can even finish a sentence, I'm already eager to answer. Because my main aim is to make sure they know what I want. And how I think. And so I will cut them off in mid-sentence because what they're saying isn't all that important anyway. If you're trapped in your own viewpoint, you can't understand a different viewpoint. That's what love is. Love is getting out of yourself. Sometimes just love of knowledge or love of a particular hobby, um, even though there's nothing particularly holy about it, can have a beneficial effect of getting you outside your own little trap and, and just thinking more broadly than yourself. What's the greatest commandment though? Love God with all your heart 
soul, mind, and strength. But see, you love, sometimes you need to love with heart before mind, thoughts, and strength, actions, will kick in. So we can know God only if we really love him too. Again, many people in our age want proofs. They want evidence. They want data. But you better take God's word for it that he does not make himself known very clearly to those who don't want to know him, to those who just aren't interested because they don't love him. When you have a loving heart, it opens your mind to other people. Jesus' parable of the four soils shows the importance of the heart. Same word, same gospel of the kingdom, same Christ planting that gospel and scattering it abroad through himself and his various ambassadors, but very different results. You have hard hearts where the seed comes and is just snatched away. You have shallow hearts where there's a little soil and then all rock underneath. And those shallow hearts get all excited for a few minutes and then as soon as any kind of trouble comes along, ah, uh, see you later, that God stuff doesn't work anyway. Then you have the cluttered heart where there's weeds and thorns, there's the worries of this world and the pleasures and riches of this world. And whether it's the worries or the pleasures and riches, they are littering that soil and the good seed can't really get going very well and it's just choked out. And then there is the good heart. Those with a noble and good heart, says Jesus, and that kind of heart hears the word and understands it. You see what's going on? Same word, different kinds of hearts, only one kind of heart where that word is going to bear its proper fruit and its life. And the short upshot of that is Jesus' statement, you must be born again. You must have a new heart given to you by God or you will never take the seed into your mind permanently. It will never bear fruit in your actions. So what shapes your mind? What shapes the way you think? Well, who you hang out with, your social setting, what you do, your pattern of behavior, whether it's spattering mud on your windshield or not, and your heart. What are your drives? What are your desires? What are your motives? Because you're always going to have some wishful thinking. And if you have the right wishes, you're often going to have the right thinking. All, all thinking does involve wishful thinking. One of Pascal's great goals, he understood that because the heart has reasons of which the mind knows nothing, his strategy for apologetics, for persuading people of the gospel was this. He said, first make them want it to be true, then show it to be true. He knew that if he showed it to be true without making them want it to be true, they were not going to believe it. And of course, only God ultimately can make us want him, make us desire Jesus, make us desire that eternal life that he promises us. And so real knowledge of God and just all real knowledge seen in the light of God involves a renewed heart, it involves godly action, it involves Christian community, and it's always traffic running in all directions. It's not just if you join the right community, everything else will take care of itself. It's not just, okay, now my heart's cleaned up. Um, I don't need to think very hard. Don't need to worry about my actions. All these things were persons, and they all influence one another. So if you want to know truth, seek a new heart from God. Seek a new way of behaving from God, and be part of the community where the gospel makes sense. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for the minds you have given us, and we thank you for creating us as whole persons and not just as thinking machines. We, we pray, Lord, that more and more you will renew and restore what has gone amiss in us. We pray, Lord, grant us a clean heart, a new heart, not that heart of stone, but a living, beating heart for you that desires you and that loves you and loves others. We pray, Lord, that you will work in us to will and then to work for your good pleasure. We pray that our actions will be in keeping with the new heart that you give us. And we pray, too, for the mind of, of Christ in which 
our understanding grows and grows as we desire and as we live in your ways. And Lord, we pray that the bonds of love that we have and the community ties that we share will also be uh, strengthening and not draining for our faith. We thank you, Lord, for godly families, for close Christian friendships, for the body of Christ in which all of your truths um, shine with greater light and make more sense to us. And Lord, where our families have made the gospel less believable, less plausible, Lord, restore them and make them again shine with your truth. Where our church or other congregations are falling short of being the plausibility structure where the gospel makes sense, renew us and build us up. And Lord, help us to also be aware of these things when we face the attacks of the evil one or or the ideas of unbelievers who say that it just doesn't make sense to believe what we believe. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to understand the, their condition as well, to realize that we can't fix everything just by giving them a good explanation. We pray, Lord, that you will work in them to change their hearts, give us love for others, a desire for their well-being, a, a desire to encourage and bless them. Lord, you loved us while we were still your enemies. Help us to love those who may be our opponents in important ways and by that love to demonstrate your truth so that all men will know we're your disciples by the way we love one another and by the way that we love you and by the way that we love even those who are not yet part of your body. For Jesus' sake, amen.